Hey there, it's Elliot. Before we get to the episode, I want to encourage you to subscribe to this podcast so that you get alerts every time we post a new episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, tell other people about it. We're really looking to help people understand how the role of the CCO is evolving. And if you can help us reach more people with that message, it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks so much. Jin Montesano oversees communications at Lixel, one of Japan's leading manufacturers of water and housing products. Her official title is actually leader of people and culture, and communications falls within that remit. Her role actually expanded to include HR and culture. But it wasn't that long ago that the odds that Jin would still be in her position at all were unquestionably not in her favor. When Jin took the job, she was not expecting a struggle for control of the company in the form of an ugly proxy battle. She certainly didn't think she'd be stuck in the middle of it and that her career and livelihood would be at stake. This is a big and fascinating story, so let's start at the beginning. We actually interviewed Jin a few years ago for this podcast about her role with Lixel. I think Japan is probably the most interesting and most complex place I've worked. As one of Japan's largest makers of in-home appliances, it's the kind of company that manufactures thousand-dollar toilets and beautiful fixtures. Every person on the planet dreams of a better home. But with Jin's leadership, Lixel had also developed a five-dollar toilet designed to bring basic sanitation to parts of the world where lack of a bathroom is a serious threat to both health and safety, especially for young women. It was an example of the kind of socially conscious business the company was telling the world was possible. When we first interviewed Jin, she was proud of the fact that the program was not a charity. It had been created to function as a self-sustaining part of the business, and while it wasn't a source of major profit, it also didn't cost much money to run. This approach came at the urging of her CEO, Kinya Seto, who was committed to social purpose and saw it as key to the company's future. Though that vision was supported by leadership, there were fundamental differences of opinion for the direction of the company. That a power struggle resulted from those differences is not unusual. What is, though, is the fact that this one spilled out into public view. Or, as reporter Leo Lewis put it in the Financial Times, he puts it, this was an old-fashioned Japanese stitch-up that was very publicly unstitched. And I, I thought that was such a brilliant line. In the end, before Lixel could become the company that Kenya envisioned, he'd first need to wage an internal power struggle against the company's legacy power brokers. This week, we're pulling the thread and tracing the impact of this uncommonly public fight for power. I'm Elliot Mizrahi, and this is The New CCO. In 2011, five companies that were in the business of making specific segments of the home, they all came together. The way Jin tells this story, the founding of Lixel almost sounds a bit like the beginning of a fairy tale. A top bathroom maker and a top tile maker and a top uh, exterior interior windows maker. Um, looking out at the Japanese market um, landscape and what was happening here with declining and aging population, they decided to forge a united future. So these five top domestic companies came together and brought their companies together and formed Lixel. In the spirit of this united future, they decided to give a new name to their company. So Lixel is actually a created word and L-I-X-I-L is really um, symbolic of the intersection between life and living. With this united future uh, now solidified, uh, Lixel went on to acquire additional global companies. From there, Lixel starts acquiring companies in the United States and Germany with the intention of becoming a global player in its space. As you and I both know, uh, just because you've acquired companies doesn't make you global. And that is really when my journey began with the company in 2014. I got a call from my previous boss at GE uh, named Yoshiaki Fujimori, and he actually became the first CEO of Lixel. And he was appointed in 2011 when the five companies had merged. And he rang me to say that Lixel was on this very ambitious journey to globalize, and would I be willing to come out and help him um, transform this company and really help the organization, employees, and stakeholders 
understand what they're really about. And uh, after, you know, probably 11 months of discussions, I ended up deciding to go and help him in Tokyo. And that, that's how I made the journey from Brussels to Tokyo. Jin had experience leading as an outsider. She'd worked in Singapore and Bangkok. And when she got the offer to join her old boss in Tokyo, Jin was working as CCO of GSK Vaccines, a large vaccine manufacturer in Belgium. It prepared me very well for what I was going to find myself in with regard to Lixol here in Japan. Working with the Belgians and the Europeans in particular, I think there were a lot of similarities that I could draw on in terms of um, how, to, how to tackle being an outsider and how to tackle a situation where people are really long-standing members of that organization and community. People don't really move around. Coming into her new job, Jin's first responsibility as CCO was obviously to unite this new and increasingly global company. So by the time 2013 came around, uh, the CEO was under um, tremendous pressure to figure out what is the core narrative of this company? You know, what is the raison d'etre? You know, what is the purpose of this company being amalgamated in this way? And I'm not talking just simply with shareholders, but also, of course, with employees. Now you've got tens of thousands of employees living and working overseas, and nobody really understands why they're part of this organization. Um, and there wasn't yet a clear story forming. People were working very hard in Tokyo, but it was not yet um, a global organization. She quickly found that even just basic communication was a problem. In fact, you even had uh, trouble finding people who could communicate in English. So there were real challenges. Um, so that was really where I had to roll up my sleeves and figure out how do we quickly connect and at least communicate why this is a shared journey that they should buy into. During those early years, the Japanese business landscape was working its way through a slow transformation of its own. Japan is, is just infinitely interesting, and so intellectually it becomes a very stimulating place. I, I think it's fair to say that um, you know, Japan has, the, the corporate sector has experienced tremendous success, especially in the 70s, 80s, and up until the 90s before um, the Lehman shock and, and then the recession that ensued. And I think it became evident uh, to government and other industry watchers um, that in order for Japan to truly um, reset the corporate uh, landscape, it needed to adopt more best-in-class uh, corporate reforms. A lot of what we were seeing happening in other parts of the world, especially in, the, in Europe and in the US. Um, and so, for example, um, under Prime Minister Abe, he took on a, a very strong mantle to try and accelerate this reform, in part by enhancing governance and stewardship in Japan. So in 2017, um, Prime Minister Abe led the effort to revise Japan's stewardship code, and it required institutions, for example, many things happened under that code, but it required institutions to disclose their votes on each agenda item, for example. Um, they also now risked losing capital that were entrusted to them if they're seen to be voting against shareholder interests. That might sound strange to Americans, and as an American and someone who's worked in companies like GE, you know, where it's all about the investor interests. But in fact, in Japan, I think Japanese corporations really thought about um, their role in society, about longevity, about really being able to survive and thrive and reinvent itself over a long course of time. It wasn't always about uh, shareholder interests. And um, with these reforms and a greater focus on whether there is a return on capital happening uh, for shareholders, that started to change and increase the standards for how corporations should be run. So the proxy battle that happened it's really about giving voice to minority shareholders and that voice being more able to be heard as part of the corporate reforms. We haven't yet talked about founding family interests, and that's a running theme in a lot of Japanese companies. I don't know that people like to talk about it too much. Why would you say that it's a sensitive topic? Well, 
I think because it's quite unique um, in that corporations that are publicly listed and regulated under the Tokyo Stock Exchange rules, uh, as well as the corporate governance rules set by the government, um, should be really um, behaving and acting in accordance with shareholder and broader stakeholder interests. And so the, by definition, uh, founding family interests really should be relegated to um, their holding as shareholders, but not necessarily having an undue influence on the way the corporation behaves, uh, one could argue, right? In our instance, um, the, one of the members of the founding family of um, one company, Tostem, uh, Mr. Yoichiro Ushioda, he was actually chair, chairman of the board, and um, a, a key, key actor in this broader um, boardroom drama. In Lixel's case, it's fair to say there were a lot of competing interests. But there was an agreement at the time of the merger that these founding family interests should be um, subordinated to the organization's desire to globalize and professionalize. In reality, things were a bit more complicated. So let's let's lay out the pieces on this chessboard. Um, who, who are the players here in the events we're, we're about to discuss? There were other founding family interests uh, on the board, like Mr. Ina, uh, who is part of the family that founded Inax, um, you know, one of the most prestigious um, bathroom and toilet brands uh, in Japan and also in the region. The other major player was Jin's direct boss, CEO Kinya Seto. And pretty much right away, Mr. Ushioda and his new CEO came into conflict. We had a situation where the founding family, um, or at least this one particular um, founding family interest, which was um, Mr. Ushioda, you know, he really wanted Lixil to become more of a holding group and a conglomerate where we held many different types of businesses and manage those businesses, much like a portfolio of companies. And that's not necessarily wrong, um, but it was not necessarily founded out in the data and uh, the numbers as to whether the company could afford to be that or whether it was in fact the best way for shareholders to be uh, receiving a return on investment from that strategy. And um, I think when Kenya arrived, the other player in this boardroom drama, when Kenya arrived in January 2016, he very quickly, um, during his first 100 days, could assess that the company really um, had a lot of challenges. And the only way it could really um, manage itself through and become sustainable, standing up on its own and um, getting out of what he would regard as some of the more danger zones, was in fact to clean up and focus on the core and um, divest the businesses that were non-core. And, and one would think that a founding family would want to globalize and professionalize the organization. Well, of course, they did. They genuinely did. Um, there was a sincere belief. I think, um, I, you know, in part, uh, my appointment and uh, the, the warm reception I received was all part of that. Um, there was an appreciation and a desire to globalize quickly because globalization meant uh, a more stable future, uh, a future with um, growth and, um, you know, being able to protect and enhance uh, all of the organization's various interests. However, the question is really about how one should globalize and what strategies are necessary to achieve the goals of the corporation and whether founding family interests should have an undue say in what those strategies should be. And I think this is where we started to have some challenge. There was perhaps a lot of pressure through management discussions and through board discussions to go in a, a direction that wasn't necessarily um, the view of everyone else at the table. 
it's not a news story where you have a CEO and a chairman on different pages strategically. Hmm. Despite the friction, as soon as he's installed as CEO, Kenya starts making transformative moves. He had been making significant progress in really shifting and transforming Lixalt. He was very quick to figure out where we needed to go and what we needed to do, certainly in his first three years, to establish us as a more modern, entrepreneurial, simpler company, more transparent, focusing on the core and really investing behind people. All the things that you think are really um, the right direction to go for a new CEO, very clear plan, working hard to align everyone to this new agenda. Over time, however, this notion of becoming a more focused, integrated operating company uh, started to create some tensions between uh, himself and the founding family. And, and it really is about the philosophy and the direction of the company. So in October of 2018, uh, he's been in the role for uh, almost two years. Um, Kenya is informed by the nominating committee that they've decided to replace him. And, you know, there's some confusion over how this decision came to be. It was, of course, a complete surprise to Kenya. Um, and he was effectively misled into resigning. What was your reaction that day when you heard the news? Well, I couldn't believe it. He was um, actually, he was on vacation and it was a Saturday evening and I was cooking dinner and you know, the pasta has to be stirred. And I pick up the phone and it's Kenya. It was very quickly um, a serious conversation. Kenya tells Jin he's resigned, which to her came as a complete shock. In fact, it was to be announced that following Tuesday. And I said, I'm sorry, what? Essentially on Halloween, October 31st, um, and uh, I like to say very darkly, it was much more trick than treat. Um, we had to go to investors and the media, and rather than announcing our first half earnings results, which was what was scheduled to be announced on October 31st, we had to inform them of a major leadership transition where Kenya stopping in his tracks of this transformation would be stepping down and installed in his place would be the chairman himself who would take over as the CEO. Taking Kenya's place was chairman and founding family member, Mr. Ushioda. And Mr. Yamanashi, um, a, an outside board director at that point, would assume the role of COO. Now, both Mr. Yamanashi and Mr. Ushioda are also members of the nominating committee. You know, the nominating committee that had decided to replace him. And they essentially had decided to replace him with themselves. Right after this was announced, you can imagine the chaos that ensued. And from November 1st onward, immediately, in fact, hours later, we started to get calls from investors. What happened? What happened at that nominating committee meeting? You know, what happened at the board? Because the nominating committee makes a decision, and then that nominating committee must bring that to the full board, and then the full board must vote. And so the nominating committee received his resignation, Kenya's, and made a proposal or a recommendation to the full board to install um, Mr. Ushioda as the CEO and Mr. Yamanashi as the COO. And there ensued, of course, a very, um, a, a very vociferous uh, boardroom discussion, um, but in the end, uh, that went ahead. But there was one wrinkle in their plan. The way it works in Japan is, though he has resigned from his position as the CEO, he's still a board director. He's holding on to his board seat, so you can imagine what those board meetings must have been like. Despite stepping down as CEO, Kinyu was still part of the company. He was expected to finish out his time and go quietly, but once he realized that he'd been misled into resigning, Kenya decided to fight back. At the same time, um, Kenya took a decision in his own mind, and I think that's a really important turning point in this story. He decides, actually, what had happened is wrong. So he decides to challenge the governance himself. You know, we have a handful of 
long hold passive um, institutional shareholders, um, arguably, you know, the really the, 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 the kind of shareholders companies want to have, uh, who'd been uh, owning Lixel shares for a very long time. And they began to activate on their own. I mean, these are long hold passive shareholders who decided what's gone down here doesn't make a lot of sense and I've got questions. And so they started to ask questions and I run the IR team as well as the media team. And I can say that internally, uh, we weren't able to get concise answers to respond to our stakeholders queries. And, uh, you know, it was actually strangely rather calm. And, you know, I would go to Mr. Ushioda or Yamanashi and say, look, we're really getting a lot of questions here. Is there any way you can share with me the minutes or is there any way I can have a copy of this or that? Or would you like to sit down with investors and explain to them? Because it's really important. These are very um, significant investors, major investors, and we need to help them understand the situation. And um, there wasn't a lot of urgency to responding to these investors' questions. Obviously, that wasn't to um, satisfaction um, and good for them that it wasn't, frankly. Um, they were really holding us to account. So under all of this pressure and of course uh, an unwillingness on the board to really have an open conversation, the company decides to conduct an investigation. So the board initiates what is called a review of the decision-making process for the change of CEO, right? And the company conducts this investigation uh, with a third party and it announces the results of that on February 25th. And it completely fails to convince shareholders. So we're right back to where we were. And what results is that it leads to a group of shareholders who have banded together to achieve the minimum 3% shareholding threshold that's required under the Tokyo Stock Exchange and the regulatory authorities to submit a proper shareholders proposal. So that 3% threshold is actually hard to achieve and it, and it sets a very high bar. But a group of shareholders basically threw in all of their shares to form that 3%. And on March 22nd, the company received a receipt of request from these shareholders to hold an EGM or an extraordinary general meeting of shareholders to vote on the removal of Mr. Ushioda and Mr. Yamanashi as directors. So this is the next big move in the drama. That is tremendous pressure on the board. And this is obviously very public. Uh, the shareholders um, were all foreign shareholders, um, such as Marathon Asset Management um, and uh, Indus and Polar. Uh, a, a number of really highly respected and quite prestigious institutional investors. And they actually informed the media themselves that they would be calling for this because of the lack of satisfaction um, to their questions regarding governance. Under immense pressure and more media coverage and more chaos ensuing, um, there is a discussion among board members. And long story short, on April 18, these two directors, Mr. Ushioda and Mr. Yamanashi, they announced their resignation as directors. Director of Director of CEO of Yamanashi Hirokazu. Yamanashi, Mr. Ushioda and Mr. Yamanashi would keep their new positions of CEO and COO, respectively. But in return, they agreed to step down from their previous positions on the board. What that means is they will remain as management, but they will be stepping down from the board. Mr. Ushioda will step down um, pretty much immediately, but Mr. Yamanashi will stay on until the AGM, or the annual general meeting, in June. And so he still held on to that management position and he was still very much active and um, operating in the company right up until the end. This is all part of his 
a broader strategy. He figures this will this will calm down these activated shareholders. The EGM request will be withdrawn, and the company may now go back to quietly um, going on with what it is that he wanted the company to do. However, it didn't work. Instead, this group of shareholders met with Kenya and came up with their own slate of potential leaders. They actually began to talk about whom they think could be qualified to sit on the board and steer this company in the right direction. But the shareholders and Kenya Seto as a group um, were very good at articulating uh, their, their position and why they believed that their direction was the superior direction for Lixel. And so I think as much as anything, this was a media and communications campaign victory uh, because being able to reach all the other shareholders, the thousands of other shareholders that are out there that aren't part necessarily of this fight, were able to read and reflect and understand where these activated shareholders and Kenya were coming from. The plan? To take on the founding family interest head to head and install their own leadership team. But before we get into exactly how the newly ousted Kenya and this small group of shareholders fought back, it's important to understand just how unconventional this move was. Because you've got to understand that other backdrop in Japanese society is you don't create a lot of noise and inconvenience for others. This is not something you do. Um, and if you look back on the history uh, of Japanese um, you know, corporate uh, whistleblowing or activation, you know, you, you don't see a lot of sympathy for the person who was ousted um, and who makes a lot of noise. Um, this isn't done in Japan. So in many ways, uh, on a hundred different levels, uh, you know, ro- rules were breaking and norms were changed, I think, in the way that this um, shareholder battle ensued. At this point, Jin was now reporting directly to the new CEO, Mr. Ushioda. During this period, the management, um, which is basically the CXOs, all the C-suite players, management who are reporting directly into the CEO and COO, people like me, uh, a number of us started to talk about our concerns about the situation. And 10 of us signed a group letter that went from us to the board expressing our concern for what was happening, um, expressing concerns for the direction under new management and raising uh, key points as to what we could be doing to set this course right. We also articulated as the group that is the most senior rank managing day-to-day operations of the entire corporation, we also reminded the board of what damage we were creating um, with employees, with business partners, customers, and the kind of shareholder value that was being lost as part of all the leaks to the press and so forth. And we called for uh, the board to really reconsider some of the things that we knew that they were wanting to do or planning to do and to really try and bring this uh, quickly to a close. And as you can imagine, the board was not appreciative of hearing from the management in this way. And unfortunately, that that also was leaked um, we actually ultimately sent uh, three letters, um, but one of them was leaked to the press, and that became also another, of course, storyline for the media. Uh, at this point, everything was pretty much leaking, and it was really hard to contain things. The purpose of the letters were to help connect the board to the realities of the impact of what was happening here. We were very, very focused on preventing uh, a proxy battle to ensue. We wanted to avoid that at all costs. We also, so we talked a lot about the costs and monies that were being spent, um, which we did not believe was needed to resolve the situation. Uh, we also asked for a reinstatement of Kenya Seto as the CEO, because we believed that the direction and the strategy set by Kenya was in fact going to generate shareholder value and it was the right course for the company. So we took a very strong stand on that um, at that time. And so, um, you know, it was very high stakes 
um, when we got to the AGM on June 25th. Yeah, I want to spend a moment on the stakes here, Jen. I mean, it sounds to me like for, for there's a chunk of time in here where you're the CCO for a company whose leadership is taking the organization in a direction that's not the direction you came aboard to help pursue. Yeah. And so, you know, you've come with with an expectation that you're going to unify this company around a purpose. And now you're the CCO of an organization that's headed towards being a holding company. And all the while, you're you you, you sort of had a, have a foot in both camps, not not in a bad way, but you've got your professional obligations to the organization, which is at the time led by Mr. Shioda. But you're part of this group of ten yeah. that's expressing yeah. concern. Yeah. What are you thinking at that time period? You know what's going through your head. You, you said the stakes are high. I mean, what are the stakes for you in that moment? What are you thinking? Well, personally, for me. I came to work every day expecting to be fired. Um, I was challenging um, all sorts of things every day, which I believed in my heart wasn't right for the corporation. So you can imagine the kind of pressures I was under and employees were um, circulating articles and um, commenting on the articles and trying to understand what was going on. And I was on a constant battle because management wanted me to shut it down the it that Jin is referring to here is Facebook Workplace, which had only recently been introduced into the company. In this vacuum of information, Workplace became a venue for employees to share and discuss the latest developments. The old guard was already wary of Workplace because they regarded it as a distraction and a platform that was beyond their control. Now they were pressuring Jin to shut it down. And um, I didn't think that was right. Employees needed to know, but you know, we weren't exactly happy to be doing town halls at this point, despite my encouragement to be more transparent to employees. So uh, not only were we not communicating well to employees at this time, but I was under tremendous pressure to shut this thing down, quote unquote. As a quick aside here, Workplace in this case did exactly what you would want it to do. It empowered employees. In fact, there was a non-organized group of a few employees that emerged as key influencers, reporting and explaining what was going on blow by blow. Jin's team began calling them the Kami Shebun, or the Seven Gods, because of the important role they were playing in the absence of transparent communication from the top. Jin says this was when Workplace became truly acculturated, a quote, people's platform, as she put it, and a key mechanism for driving change in the company. And, uh, you know, I expected to be fired so that they could then shut it down. And, and so, as you can imagine, there were little things like this every day. I had talented people leaving my, my team saying, Jin, um, you know, this is causing a lot of noise and uncertainty. And I'm pretty sure you're going to leave. So I probably should leave. And frankly, I wasn't stopping these people because I myself wasn't sure what was going to happen to me. So I supported everything. Jin, why, why do you think they didn't fire you? Um, I don't know, actually. So I'm, I'm the, at this point, I'm the only foreign executive officer sitting in the corporation. Perhaps they thought that firing me would create more noise. I'm not really sure, to be honest. I, I, my personal relationship with Mr. Yamanashi and Mr. Ushiro was perfectly cordial. And Mr. Yamanashi and Mr. Ushioda often praised me for the work that I did in building Lixil's sustainability strategy and getting us to um, a leadership position on the ESG indexes, as well as, you know, uh, founding Sato and getting Sato off the ground um, and doing that, that work. But it was a struggle because I am in Japan um, at the pleasure of uh, an employment pass sub given to me by the government due to my work at Lixel. So I knew that if I'm fired, I'm essentially deported. And where am I going to go, Elliot? I've been working and living for over 20 plus years outside of the United States. Though I am American, I have basically been living in Bangkok and Brussels, Singapore, and now Tokyo. Where is home? Where am I going to go and land up? When I talked with other executive officers, they said, well, since they're Japanese, well, I might take a break or I might retire. I might reflect on what all happened. But for me, I was going to need to pack up and find a place to, to restart my career. So it was a very, very difficult time. Um, 
In the meantime, I had many, many members of my team coming to me and asking me, what's happening? Will you quit, Jen? And this, this was almost every day. And I could see the insecurity and, and fear and concern. And so I told people, no, I'm here. Please relax. And, you know, we're just do the right thing. Let's focus on what we need to get done. And I really spent a lot of time buying a lot of free lunches. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and coaching people and calming people. But I myself wasn't sure. And at this point, I was starting to get recruiters approaching me. Uh, ultimately, I did receive two um, offers of employment, um, both of them actually in Singapore. Um, and, and that's when I called Roger. I was very confused. Um, a lot of my mentors were advising me on what I should be doing. Very senior mentors were now, you know, CEOs of major companies, people I had worked for in the past, um, people that I really trusted their judgment. And some of the advice I was getting was, you need to get out of there, Jen, because you're an executive officer. And the things that's going on, if you're still there, then you're tainted by that. You're doing, you're considered to be doing those bad things. You're considered to be aiding and abetting. Others said, um, get out to, to separate yourself from what's happening um, before you become liable, you know, uh, because there might be, you know, shareholders suing the corporation. I was more worried about being an economic refugee after 22 years, where am I gonna go? Um, I had friends who were saying, um, you know, you can't win this and you're not going to ever work in Japan again. So when I finally did get an offer and it was all a bit of a fog, I don't even know how I, you know, went through these interview discussions, but, um, I was very frank with everybody, um, and the company that eventually made this offer to me. Jin's referring to Roger Bolton, the president of Page. Roger's accustomed to offering guidance to CCOs, having been one himself at Aetna. I rang Roger and I said, Roger, I really need your advice. I'm so confused and I can't sort out my thoughts. 99% of my mental energy is focused on how to keep the team together, how to keep the company's reputation afloat, uh, even though it's of course already in tatters, and, and to do what I believe is right. Should I step back and start to look after myself here? What should I do? What did you want to hear from Roger? I didn't have anything I wanted to hear, but I was desperate for um, a voice that was not in Japan, who knew me, um, who knew me for a certain set of skills, and that could really advise truly from an objective point of view, because all the other people I was seeking advice from were in Japan and understood the backdrop and they were reading the news and they knew what was going on. And so it was a very, very strong um, sense that I needed to save myself. He was out in his vacation home. So he said, okay, I have some time. Sure. What's going on? And so I ran through everything. I said, this is what's happened. This is what's happening. And I've done this and I'm not sure about surviving every day. I think I'm going to get fired. I have a job offer now, Roger, and this is what it is. Shall I take it? First thing he said was, well, that's not a CCO position. And I said, well, yes, that's true. But, um, you know, can beggars be choosers at this point? <laughs> and he said, you're not a beggar. You're a CCO. Well, why would you look at a position that's not a CCO position? And I said, Roger, did you not hear everything I've been telling you that's going down right now? He was very calm and matter of fact, and I almost resented his calm, matter of fact attitude. I said, Roger, I need to secure myself. You know, I've got family, you know? Um, he said, look, I was in a similar situation once, not exactly the same. And I understand what you're going through. And so he really was very empathetic and he, he started with empathy. And he said, I know it's really confusing and complicated um, and it's difficult to sort out your thoughts. So I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I will tell you what I did. And I asked myself these three questions. First, is there going to be a finite end to this? Or is this just a never-ending debacle? Um, 
uh, there is no light at the end of this tunnel. Second, do you have any remaining influence in this battle, in this saga, in this crisis? Do you have any influence at all to make a contribution? And number three, um, do you believe what you're fighting for is right? And essentially, he said, if the answer is yes to two of the three things, preferably all three, then, well, um, this is all for naught. And, you, you know, for me, he said, you know, it was yes. And so he decided to stay and fight on. Maybe I did call Roger, hoping to hear that. I'm not sure. But when he outlined these three questions, I immediately felt better. I immediately felt better. And so in the end, I, I actually reflected on it. And I said, no, I have to stay. I can't accept this role. And I, I immediately called the company and declined it. Well, actually, I called my husband first and said, I'm going to do this. I know it sounds like a crazy one, but I'm going to decline <laughs> it. <laughs> and at this point, you know, he had both hands up in the air and said, you know what? I trust you. You figure out what you, you've got to do, what you think is right. And so I was very grateful and thankful, but I, I declined the offer. And, you know, after that, it was just head down you know, back to the grindstone and really working toward the June 25th AGM. That's it. The rest is history. After this intense battle on June 25th, all eight director candidates from Kenya Slate were voted onto the board. Some other members of the company Slate also made it onto the board. And so there were, in the end, 14 new directors to the board, most of them outside directors, and Kenya was reinstated as the CEO. I mean, it was an extraordinary uh, moment and a day when no one could really know the outcome of how things were going to, to play out. Uh, first thing the next morning at 8 a.m., we held a town hall, a digital live town hall for all employees who wanted to join, and he was right back at it. And so it, it was, you know, an extraordinarily rambunctious period that kind of ended just like that, boom. Since returning as CEO, Kenya has accelerated his transformation of the company, making significant changes while putting in place measures to ensure this type of thing never happens again. So Jin, my, my last question. Um, your role as a CCO really mattered here uh, and, and in a non-conventional way, I mean, you know, you, you were running IR and government affairs and you were doing all the conventional things that a CCO would do. But, you know, it, it, what I find interesting here is, you know, what was at stake were competing visions about the future of the company, one of which was very much about the way we talk about the new role of the CCO, about purpose and sustainability and governance and transparency. How... How do you think it mattered that you played the role that you played in this story? And what does that say to you, or what do you think it should say to others about how the role of the CCO is involved and how it can be impactful? Well, I think CCOs are more vital than ever before on the board and at the Exco level. I, my, you know, my role was principally CCO as an integrator um, my job was really to bring um, all of the C-suite together, to band together and take a position and really clarify our own thinking about what was all going on. Because if you think about it, you know, not all functions know how to do that, especially when you're under this kind of tremendous pressure. So my job was really to work across the aisle, work across all of the stakeholder groups within the company, help them understand what was going on without necessarily um, influencing them into one position or the other and helping them to understand that in a moment like this, we all need to be very clear about the position we're going to take because at the end of the day, uh, you need to be very clear about your purpose in the company and how you will support that company's best interests. I, I've never spent more time thinking about what is in the best interests of the company in a mindful way than I did in these nine months. 
I think Kenya also talked a lot before, you know, before his um, ouster about doing the right thing. Do the right thing is actually one of our three behaviors. And people think do the right thing means, oh, yeah, be legally compliant, you know, do right by the law, be be ethically upright. But actually at Lixil, do the right thing means think for yourself. Don't just be swayed by what other people tell you or in a meeting when a boss tells you this is the right way to do this. Always question and make your own decisions about what is right. Have clear conviction and purpose for yourself every day at work. And I have to say that that was really a guiding light for me throughout this because at the end of the day, you walk away with your own body and your health. That's it. I mean, it's like that in most roles. We forget all the trappings really are just um, just that, trappings. At the end of the day, you need to be able to sleep with yourself, be able to explain yourself to your friends and family and those who matter. And I think having clear conviction and purpose and doing the right thing is at the heart of the CCO's leadership role. Right after the shareholder battle, Financial Times reporter Leo Lewis summed up the story like this. He puts it, this was an old fashioned Japanese stitch up that was very publicly unstitched by the new norms of the market. And I, I thought that was such a brilliant line. I mean, he's a great writer, but it is brilliant because with the backdrop of the stewardship code changes and the enhancements that are being made on Japanese corporations, I think Japanese companies do feel more exposed to criticism if they're just voting with management. Um, they need to also practice having clear conviction and purpose and voting um, by, with their belief and not just by the tradition, which is just vote with the corporation's position. Because think about it, a lot of institutional investors broke from that norm. The other thing Jin mentioned to me is that this story is a good example of the importance of corporate governance. It's important for the CCO to understand the rights of the corporation as well as of key stakeholders, and that we should always keep in mind the operating environment as it's setting a higher bar for companies and executives. You know, much of the work that I do right now is to restore the trust and stability of employees. You know, when, when Kenya came back, it wasn't necessarily um, okay, we're right back to the saddle, right? I mean, you still had to help clear up the confusion that was generated. Many employees didn't understand half of what was going on. So it's really about repairing, restoring, and regaining the trust um, of employees to understand that these very, very senior executives um, are looking after the best interests uh, for them and for the corporation as a whole, and to regain the trust that was lost during these uh, nine months. So I think this is, again, the role of the CCO. Then when Kenya won the vote, um, he appointed me as chief people officer on that day. And so my reward um, for Kenya and the shareholders winning was to have an expanded role. And on that day in 2019, I began this additional responsibility to help recover employees and really um, focus in on how we can help employees now get on board to what we want to be doing with the company and, and into the future. So I am one of three inside directors along with the CFO, Mr. Matsumoto, and of course, Kenya Seto, our CEO. And the three of us are the management directors and then the six outside directors um, now form the board as uh, approved by the AGM in 2020. So that was this year. Well, congratulations for that. And I think just generally, Jin, for the courage of your convictions. You know, it sounds like you, you had to steer some extremely turbulent water and to do it at stakes to you personally yeah. that were, yeah. were much more severe than maybe they would have been for, for some of the other leaders involved here. And I think the greatest justice here is that you're now helping steer the company in the direction that, that you came to that company to do, right? I agree. To, to create I one agree. Lixel. I agree, Elliot. And, you know, in the darkest of moments, um, when things looked really, really bad, and, you know, we, we never really got into some of those moments, but um, I would say to Kenya, you know, I'm an American and 
in American movies, when the bad guys are winning, the movie ain't over. And it really was a joke, but I think it was a philosophy that I held to that um, I honestly believe the good guys always win. And sure, I'm sure there are people who are going to listen to this and say, really, Jen, were you among the good guys? And I would say yes, because this is my story. And I strongly believe that the good guys always win. Maybe I'm just an optimist. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's episode of The New CCO, be sure to check out our latest episodes and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, leave us a rating and a review. We want to hear what you think so that we can keep making this podcast more interesting and valuable to you. To find out more about what's happening at PAGE, please visit us at page.org. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on The New CCO.